Good evening and welcome everyone to this evening's webinar from the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. We're calling it Economic and Budget Crises Pile Up. The National Infrastructure Bank can make for a happier Thanksgiving. Now, of course, this is the season of the year when we, when we really all want to count our blessings and be grateful. But on the other hand, we also need to be aspirational and think about not what we have, but what, how things could be. And that is really sort of the focus of our webinar this evening is to think about the improvements and the benefits to our country that would come from implementing a national infrastructure bank. We have a great lineup of speakers for you this evening. Uh, my name is Julie Olson. I'm your moderator this evening. And we will be moving uh, right on through our panel of esteemed speakers and uh, leaving time at the end for questions, comments, and, and answers. Okay, so for our first speaker, we will go to the Chief Economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition, Al Fekka Mutari. Al Fekka, the screen is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, I would like to talk about where we are with the bill where we are with all of our many crises <laughs> and give you an opening uh, salvo on how the National Infrastructure Bank can uh, work around all of these problems. So um, where we are with the bill, um, the we now have 18 co-sponsors on 19 co-sponsors, including the main sponsor on the bill. Uh, we have, we're act, our whole grassroots campaign is working overtime on steroids, so to speak, to uh, to bring in more co-sponsors. And the the to show you how successful uh, this this is uh, this can be and what how effective grassroots workers can be, our latest um, endorser to the bill, uh, Seth Magaziner, we never even met him, but um, it was our grassroots folks that uh, brought him on as a co-sponsor. So that shows you how very effective the grassroots campaign is. And we uh, assert all through the call that uh, you, you know, it's up to you. And we really hope that you can help to bring us on. Uh, we are, our objective is to get our at least up to 30 co-sponsors on this bill to raise the awareness on it. So that's where we are on the bill. Uh, I wanted to also tell you where we are on the economy. Uh, as of this moment, it's not looking too bad. Uh, the gross domestic product growth for the third quarter came in at 4.9%. Here you can see it on the graph. This is the 4.9% growth, and it's been higher than uh, the previous four quarters. This is the COVID recession down here to show you for comparison. But this was largely, this growth was largely buoyed by consumer demand. Consumers went out and spent a lot of money over the summer or going on vacations and, you know, eating out of restaurants and things like that. Of course, those are the upper uh, income earners who were on the on the spending splurge, but it's a very different picture for the still for the lowest 40% of the population who are really struggling to make ends meet. Our labor market is still fairly tight. Uh, in, unemployment went up a little bit to 3.9% in September. Uh, that the uh, um, employment figures don't mean that we're out of the woods on the economy yet, uh, because uh, new hiring and voluntary quits are slowing down. We still have very high income inequality. This shocking statistic here I got out of one of the newspapers, CEO pay rose 40% over the last 10 years. Worker pay, ordinary worker pay rose only 8% over, of, over that period. And of course, inflation was much higher over those two year period than that. So worker pay didn't keep up. Annual inflation has cooled a little bit. It's now down to 3.2% in October. Uh, however, rents were the highest contributor. So that's really housing, uh, having affordable housing is still a big problem in the economy. The 30-year mortgage rate is now above 8%. That's killing the housing market, both on the supply and the demand side. The Fed, of course, uh, kept short-term interest rates unchanged in November at 5.5%, but the long-term rates are spiking upwards, trying to catch up. Suspect, uh, which which it, which indicates that the whole market and consumers even expect that interest rates will stay higher for longer, uh, and that will slow down. That'll that'll put throw cold water on the economy. Small businesses are really getting slammed because they're facing nine percent borrowing rates. They have put on the brakes in making new investments because they can't afford to take out new loans. If the economy turns down a little bit, they'll having they'll be having problems paying even the old loans. 
So the situation is very dire for small businesses. Commercial bank profitability is uh, upside down. I'll cover this a little bit in the next slide, but uh, the um, the Moody's, Finch, and the other rating agency has downgraded scores of banks for this reason. Uh, and a, a finally, a survey, and a survey of economists that came out in October found that they had changed their forecasts a little bit. Now they're moving it from a recession in 2024 to a soft landing. However, all of the indicators underneath the economy don't look good. The leading indicators that forecast a, a recession coming are all still pointing downward. Retail spending has slowed down, way down. Banks are cutting back on lending because of the banking crisis. A cooling labor market and a sagging housing market all way on the economy and consumer savings are drying up. So those that big consumer spending that's holding the economy up might not last for longer. We do have a banking crisis. We're all today talking about all the crises that are interfering with our turkey festivities next week. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about that, and but because it has not evolved to the point of crisis yet. Uh, you saw the first signs of it with the closure of Silicon Valley Bank earlier in the year. And of course, the Fed policies of trying to tamp down on inflation, raise interest rates and con contract the money supply, all of that has upset the balance sheets in various different ways of banks. And regional banks have a special problem because they're concentrated lending in the real estate market. And we have a whole lot of empty office buildings in many cities all across the country. So if there is a banking crisis on top of the other indicators for a recession, I just wanted to point out that that will make the recession even worse. And it could spiral downwards into a really bad situation. That's a potential to keep our eye on. However, on the budget side, the crisis there is definitely coming to a boil. Uh, we have already the there's contraction in the budget uh, as a result of things expiring from all the handouts that were given during COVID. Uh, that those uh, ex expirations include child care tax credits that are raising poverty and food insecurity in children, uh, child care stabilization grants for daycare. The, those a lot of those daycare facilities will close up, and then the workers and the moms won't who don't have daycare won't be able to go to work. Small uh, stimulus for small businesses and the tax uh, code, uh, all that's expiring too. So that's what's already baked in to the fiscal contraction. Add on to that. The current uh, House GOP wants to dramatically cut spending. Why did they want, maybe by upwards of 8%, when they finally get around to negotiating in seriousness about uh, uh, this year's budget, this current year's budget. Why they are so exercised is because debt is way, way up. Our deficit this year, despite the strong economy, was $2 trillion. That's very unusual for a strong economy year. As a result of all that and the fact that we are now in continuing resolution, we put off uh, discussing the budget for another couple of months or just kick the can down the road. The sides are still on either side, uh, you know, not agreeing on what, what we're going to spend on. And Moody's, as a result of all that, has lowered the outlook for the U.S. debt uh, from stable down to negative. Uh, the NIB is a budget workaround, of course. And it is able to finance all of the infrastructure that uh, we need, that we cannot finance through the budget. And it can do that as a budget workaround with no need for new spending taxes or debt. It'll offset any recession, recession in, in, in addition, because we can hire up any unemployed workers into these great paying jobs. And it's big enough to cover everything. So I just wanted to point out the, the politics of this as well. And the reaction to Bidenomics. Bidenomics is normally defined as, you know, four bills, uh, that are supposed to stimulate the economy, including the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the Climate Change Act, and the CHIPS Act to promote manufacturing. However, those three uh, bills are not being felt by the average worker. Uh, and then uh, two weeks ago, or just a little under two weeks ago, uh, all of everybody became quite consternated by a new poll that came out in the New York Times where they asked, who would you vote for? Who do you think is best uh, able to do a better job on? And then they levied it up by each one of these categories right here. And uh, what, what uh, the poll found is that Biden won high marks on the abortion issue. And of course, Democrats came out and voted favorably for several uh, pieces of legislation a week ago. That was a win for Democrats. But on the economy, things are really, really looking bad. 
And another uh, poll found that uh, the even some Black and Latino voters are saying that they either wouldn't come out and vote or they wouldn't vote for Biden because of the skyrocketing rent and a feeling, uh, you know, high prices in the grocery store and a feeling that they've just let, been left behind. Pro progressives are aware of this situation. Uh, for example, Pram Pramila Jaipal, that uh, is the House progressive leader uh, for the Democrats, called on more policies to reduce poverty and address the needs of the poor working family. But she still has in mind that she needs to do this through the budget. And that's just not going to happen because they, they want to cut the budget by eight percent. So they're not going to certainly add more spending onto it. That's it's just not going to happen. Uh, as James Carville said in 1992, it's really the economy stupid. And young people are uh, without a four year degree. There was another New York uh, Times article on this uh, follow up to the first one uh, said that uh, those are the ones that are turning away uh, that are not going to come out and vote or vote for the other side. So the three acts are not big enough to move the needle on the economy. Uh, and uh, they're not big enough to pay for infrastructure either. So the infrastructure czar, uh, who is the former mayor of um, New Orleans, Mitch Landrell, he admitted this much. He said these bills are only a start. And he also said uh, there's no point going around and saying that everything is fine and these bills will take care of everything because it's not being felt in people's pockets and, and that they, they, they hear this as being really disingenuous. Add on to all of that, we have a huge housing crisis, and a lot of people are becoming uh, unhoused or living in their cars or uh, only a paycheck away from getting evicted. We need, according to the National Low Income Housing, 7.3 million affordable housing units, and there's nothing in the budget for that. The, only the NIB is big enough to cover all of these things, and it'll supercharge the American economy, create millions of great paying jobs. We can double our GDP growth. That'll bring new tax receipts into the federal coffers and solve our debt problem. That's the way we solved it the last time with high growth, uh, with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. We didn't pay with the debt away after World War II. We just simply grew out of it. And this is another opportunity to do that, all with no new federal taxes spending our debt, reduces inflation, and offsets any coming recession. So I, I just wanted to uh, set that up as um, an opening salvo for people to talk about crises and uh, their lack of uh, infrastructure um, financing in their areas and how we can have a nice turkey dinner next week if we can all get out and get uh, support for the spill. So thanks very much. Thank you, Alfeca. Uh, Alfeca is very well versed in the ins and outs of the uh, that actual proposed legislation. In fact, she uh, really almost single-handedly wrote it herself. And of course, we've been taking input from various congressional offices. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask Alfeca in the Q&A about what is actually included in the bill. And I also do want to uh, point out that Alfeca does a monthly um, uh, economics newsletter that is very interesting. And so if you appreciate her insights on the economy, after all, she is an economist and has spent her entire career in that field, uh, you might want to sign up to get her newsletter. Okay, uh, with that, we are gonna move on to our next speaker of the evening. And we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Nomi Prinz. She is a PhD and author and a former managing director of Goldman Sachs. Uh, she also recently spent some time with our NIB coordinators in on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. And I think she might be able to give us a little report on um, some of the meetings that um, that um, our group had there uh, last week. Nomi, um, you're on. We just wanted to start by um, saying, just echoing what you said, Julie, and just actually thanking Alfeca for um, all of the, not just the detail you put into this, but all the evolving detail that happens after these meetings, after the conversations, after, uh, you know, the Capitol Hill, um, situations we have. Um, it's it's really amazing. I was in a call. This is related to, um, going backwards, this is related to the meetings that we had recently on Capitol Hill, about 20 of them, mostly with Republicans from the Energy and Commerce Committee and some of the subcommittees. Um, but I do want to work backwards into that because we had a call this morning. Alfeca was on it um, as well as Stu and Angela and, um, and uh, someone else is on it, so I don't see him on the call tonight. But anyway, um, 
And what was interesting, what, what, what I, the takeaway I got from that in terms of the big looking forward um, is that we've been talking about the bank and we've been talking about what the bank can do, all the different sectors and so forth. We've been talking about how it can help the economy. We can talk about how it can help repurpose debt and give it a better home and sort of more of a purpose, um, which can grow things for the future. Um, and, and the other thing that came out in the meeting, and it, it had to do something else that so that I found very interesting, is that the bank can actually um, make money. So it's not just stuff. Stopping the debt. It's not just repurposing the debt, but by virtue of using the, that debt that we've already issued, 500 um, billion, and then augmenting that to 5 trillion in terms of leveraging it by 10 times to back loans. Um, bank actually makes money from the loans, not just to run the bank, not just to pay the bank, not just to pay um, investors in the bank who have pledged um, effectively their treasuries as collateral to begin with, um, but also potentially to the country. So if we're talking about a situation where our debt right now, actually, it's not 33 trillion. I just checked it's 33.74 trillion. So I think we can safely call it 34 trillion right now, um, which is up about 3 trillion since the, the debate about whether or not the debt ceiling should be raised happened. Um, and, and, and we're basically 10% above where it was then. So it's, it's, it's not just repurposing, it's actually stopping the sort of evolution the increase in debt and actually taking money back out like a regular bank would do. Um, so we had those conversations on the Hill. And the reason um, we spoke with a lot of the members and predominantly Republicans from literally across the country, um, mostly, again, involved in the uh, ENC committee, some with financial services as well. But but the idea of focusing on ENC and focusing on Republicans, and it was great to have all those doors open to us to actually even have these conversations was that there is a growing recognition that we absolutely need to do something different. And uh, one of the things that uh, Representative Miller Meek said, we had a great meeting with her about finance, a little less about energy, but she is on the ENC committee. She's in the Crit Critical Resources Subcommittee. Um, she said this is great out of the box thinking um, to have this bank. Now it's not new, we all know that, it's, it's got a historical legacy in terms of helping, in terms of modeling, in terms of working through our economic problems as we've had them over the years and moving past them. Um, but it also is refreshing, um, I think, and beginning to be more refreshing. Uh, this is my hope. This is what I'm sort of giving positively into this meeting from the standpoint of a lot of Republicans, none of which have signed on yet. Why? Well, because it's not just the economy, it's the grid. Why is it the grid? And that was a, a topic that came up in a lot of our conversations, of course, with ENC. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, if you don't have a power grid that actually is effective and works for the country, then those factories that are booming in the West and the Midwest don't have the ability to actually run. Then we continue to have blackouts and brownouts in Texas. Then we continue to have problems with um, the middle part of the country when we have severe weather conditions. And so the idea of having a long-term financial solution to things that are not just problems tomorrow, but are actually problems today um, was something that I think did resonate with a lot of people and across the aisle. For example, we had a, a coffee meeting with uh, two of the senior staffers from uh, Representative Kelly's office um, from, from Illinois. And uh, we did talk about agriculture. We talked a little about AI, but we talked about how it is the grid. In fact, I said we should get them t-shirts that actually say <laughs> it's the grid, stupid. Um, but, then, but then leaving from that, uh, meeting, we actually had a, a next follow up meeting with um, Representative Michael Burgess's office, um, his senior staffer as well. It was one of those hallway meetings. So from coffee to hallway, it was an afternoon, regular afternoon in the House. Um, but there you get some of the Republican on, from Texas. So you've got a Democrat from Illinois, you got a Republican from Texas. We talked about the exact same thing. And there was the exact same form of buy-in to this idea that we need an alternative form of financing. It's not a pipe dream anymore. It's an absolute necessity. So I found that interesting that across the aisle in an area where there already is, and I keep talking about this bipartisan support, that we can continue to really, really push the envelope because we know to make this a reality, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank, we need Republicans. We know in the past it was actually Republican um, Congresses and, and White Houses that actually pushed a lot of the former incarnations of these banks forward. You know, again, we're not making this up out of nowhere. And I and I and I, I think from these meetings, um, from Miller Meeks, from Burgess's office, from from Beatty's office, and, and from Ohio Tolado's office, who's a Republican from Ohio, so you got a Democrat and a, and a Republican. These are people who are focusing on nuclear energy. They're focusing on the grid. They're focusing on better pipelines. They're focusing on water. They're focusing on cleaner. Um, 
aspects of, of getting water from, from place to place. Um, they're focusing on domestic supply to reduce inflation going forward so that we're not reliant on other countries. They, they are on bipartisan bills together um, from their own subcommittees and, and their committees. When I was there um, with Stu and Angela, the, there was an ENC meeting. 17 bills were brought up in that meeting for markup and they all passed through nine or 10 of them were nuclear. There was a hydropower one. There was a national grid one and a couple of other ones. Um, they weren't all bipartisan, but many of them were. Um, and so there is this, this place where they already recognize their need. They already know the projects and they just need the money, which they haven't even gotten to yet. So I, I came away from those meetings, though we didn't get a signature, feeling more positive than I felt about getting Republicans to sign on to this bill again, which we need, um, because they simply have a common purpose. They just need to figure out a way to fund it. And if we're talking about $34 trillion of debt right now on our books, um, by the time this Congress is over next year, when we do get into election period, we're probably talking about $36 trillion in debt, if not more. Um, it's insane. It's a lot harder to grow out when the holes are deeper and deeper. Um, so I do think they recognize this. I think it's a point to drive home as well as this idea that you've got common ground already in terms of your other initiatives and your friends across the aisle. Um, and, and this is a place I think there's really an ability to use that momentum to, to drive um, the nib forward and, and, and just get those signatures. Thank you, Naomi. Really appreciate your analysis and uh, thanks for all your help on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, it's real interesting. Naomi was talking about some of the different uh, uh, representatives in Congress that they met with and how the interests of the Republican and the Democrats were very similar. And that's what we found over and over on these calls. We have volunteers um, across the country and in every state. And one of my favorite parts of these meetings is the opportunity to hear from people uh, from different areas and to, um, to hear their concerns and, and to learn uh, what they're doing in their area in terms of infrastructure. Uh, so today I would like to um, start with our, uh, our representatives from the field. Uh, and we are gonna go to Representative Will Guzardi, uh, who's um, from Chicago, Illinois. And we were fortunate to meet with him a couple of weeks ago and um, we're enlisting his support. Um, my understanding is a resolution in support of the NIB has just been drafted uh, in Illinois. And so we're very interested to hear what, um, what's happening there in terms of uh, infrastructure. Representative Gazzardi. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, this has been very informative so far. I appreciate the, the presentations and I had a wonderful meeting with some members of the team in our district office just recently. So uh, I'm, you know, a far cry from a policy expert uh, in this area. There's a lot more expertise on this call and I look forward to learning from all of you over the course of the coming weeks, months and years as we continue to fight for this important issue. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, it's already been said that so much of the it, the sort of drive the impetus for the success of what we're going to see in Congress is going to come from the grassroots, from communities, from the local level. Uh, and so I think um, I'm excited to play uh, some small part in that by helping in, uh, introduce and advance a resolution in this Illinois state legislature to try to uh, urge Congress and call upon our, our delegation. I'm glad to say our delegation is well represented already amongst the this spot, of course, it's the bill's been introduced by an Illinois member, and uh, we've got a couple of Illinois co-sponsors on board. But um, you know, we again, I, I think there's no reason to believe that we couldn't have uh, the Democrats and Republicans from the Illinois delegation, you know, signing on to this important piece of legislation. Um, and I'll just say very briefly, you know, from from where I sit here in Chicago, the need is very urgent and very obvious. Um, you know, I think it's already been discussed the the ongoing crisis of safe water, safe drinking water around the country. You know, Chicago has more miles of uh, lead service lines than anywhere else in the country. And um, of course, the disproportionate impact on, on communities of color where those service lines are located. Um, there's just an enormous investment um, that's going to be required. I mean, 10 or 11 figures worth of investment that's gonna be required in replacing those service lines. Um, and similarly, you know, the discussion around affordable housing I know has already been touched on, but, um, but I'm the chair of the housing committee here in the Illinois General Assembly, and we have seen the tremendous need for 
uh, housing our existing unhoused population, the, um, you know, not just unhoused folks, but people who are desperately searching for an affordable place to live or being priced out of their current home. There's just a need for, again, hundreds of thousands of new units to be built here in the state of Illinois. And, and um, at the end of the day, we know that these problems are at a magnitude that state and city budgets just can't address themselves to. Um, there's just no way that our, the, the, I mean, Illinois is a wealthy state and we have a lot of resources at our disposal here, but there's no way that we alone are going to be able to bring to bear the degree of resources that are required to address themselves, these serious infrastructure problems. Um, and that's, you know, that's not even to speak about the other, many other needs we've already talked about, clean energy, uh, you know, roads, bridges, existing infrastructure that's crumbling, right, all the investments that we know are needed. Um, we're doing what we can with the local resources that we have, but we know that we need the um, the sort of wherewithal the federal government and the scale that the federal government can bring in order to uh, truly address these challenges. So that's why I personally am really excited about um, this initiative. And and um, again, you know, at the state level, there's only but so much that we can do. But I think it's really important to activate local elected officials, state level elected officials, you know, to get us educated and aware because we're the people who are trying to deal with these crises on a day-to-day -day level. And we're the folks who are, you know, precisely the folks who don't have the resources to address them, right? So we're looking for solutions. And, and to the extent that we can turn to Congress and say, um, this infrastructure bank is, is the right answer for these challenges that we're facing here at home, I think our members of Congress will hear us loud and clear. And I'll say I had a, a very fruitful conversation with some staff members of my member of Congress, Congresswoman Ramirez, and they seem very excited about uh, this issue. So uh, I'm hoping that she'll be joining as a co-sponsor soon and, uh, you know, we can help continue to build support. But I think that's that's part of how it's going to be. You know, it's a relationships business and finding those local folks who have relationships with their member of Congress. You know, Congresswoman Ramirez was a colleague of mine in Illinois House. So we just know each other and I can text her, you know, it's like that. The, those kinds of relationships really go a long way. So continue doing the work that you're doing. Get in front of your local and state elected officials and use us to help put pressure up on Congress. That'd be my my words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Representative Gazzardi. Really appreciate you being here. And um, we've been doing uh, these Zoom calls and meetings and uh, educating the public and educating our state and local representatives as well as member of Congress now for three years or so. And I wanna say that uh, the message is getting around because my understanding is that um, while our folks were on Capitol Hill, somebody actually made the comment to them, something like, oh, I heard that the National Infrastructure Bank people were here roaming around the halls. So it's really great when it gets to the point where they've actually heard of you and they know you're roaming around, you know, waiting to, uh, to pin them down and talk to them. So we just need to uh, keep going. The momentum is on our side. Um, and there is a resurgence in interest in public banking around the country. Uh, we, there's currently only one public, public bank in the U.S. that's in North Dakota, um, but I know that those conversations are taking place in red states and blue states around the country, and, are, and we are really fortunate to have with us today Ellen Brown. She is the chair of the Public Banking Institute out of Los Angeles, California. Ellen, we'll turn it over to you. So George Washington said in his farewell address, Avoid foreign entanglements and avoid excessive debt. I think you'd be a bit shocked to see where we are now. Two centuries later, we cl clearly have both problems. Um, as Nomi pointed out, we have a um, federal debt of $33.7 trillion. And um, the military budget, which is foreign entanglements, is uh, more than half of the discretionary budget. And interest on the debt is uh, approaching a trillion dollars, which is over a third of personal tax receipts. So it's huge. The debt is huge. And meanwhile, as everyone has been saying, our infrastructure is failing and there's no way that Congress is going to add more money for infrastructure this time around because they can't even agree on what they have before them. Uh, but we've been here before. <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton er, or George Washington was facing a debt in 1791. The new country was facing a debt of $77 million, which at the time was quite huge. And there was a debate in Congress whether to take over the state's debts or let the states deal with them. 
And Hamilton said, no, we can take them over. And what he did was uh, debt for equity swaps. So he took the debt in exchange for shares in the first U.S. bank, and the shares paid uh, 2%, uh, 6% dividend. And then that uh, that was used for capital along with gold. They were supposed to contribute some gold. I guess they didn't contribute as much as they were supposed to. But anyway, so they leveraged that capital into credit, which was basically the Bank of England model. But the difference was the Bank of England was privately owned by um, private speculators. And their goal, obviously, was to make money for themselves. Whereas um, the first U.S. bank under Hamilton's system of public credit was designed for um, internal improvements and other economic development. So it's basically a development bank. And when that charter ran out um, and they started the second U.S. bank, it was also a, basically a development bank. <clears throat> uh, and a lot of development ha happened during the time of the second U.S. bank including the Erie Canal, which is what that picture is of. But of course, Andrew Jackson waged, waged war on the second U.S. Bank and took it down. So when President Lincoln came into office, uh, he was dealing with the Civil War debt and no way to fund it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He was uh, dealing with uh, 24 to 36% interest rates that he would have to pay to the British back bankers. So instead, he resorted to what the uh, American colonists did, which was just issue the money directly. So he issued paper greenbacks or U.S. notes. And he issued enough greenbacks that he actually doubled the money supply. Plus, um, his government founded the national bank system where banks, in order to join the system, banks had to, um, they could print their own bank notes that said National Bank of whatever, that city. Um, but but they had to capitalize their bank notes with government debt, so they had to buy some bonds. So those two new sources of uh, income were sufficient to allow the North to win the Civil War and for the new country or the the country now now rejoined country to um, rapidly develop economically, including most most impressively the Transcontinental Railroad, which linked both ends of the nation by 1869 and actually turned a profit for the government. Uh, plus, uh, factory output boomed and uh, agriculture flourished because of um, mechanization. And for all that, we didn't have inflation or significant inflation. I mean, it's arguable, but anyway, you can see on this chart that, that inflation didn't really take off until the dollar went off the gold standard, which then allowed all this expansion of the money supply into all kinds of fluff, as Nomi says, that aren't backed by anything. Anyway, the whole shadow banking system, et cetera. So, however, unfortunately, Lincoln was assassinated. The greenbacks were discontinued. Silver was demonetized. It was formerly allowed as uh, capital for banks. And uh, in the late 19th century, we went into a deep depression. 1906, we had a major uh, banking crisis. And the upshot of that was the Federal Reserve in 1913, which was supposed to prevent bank runs and banking crises. But in fact, in um, the early 1930s, we had the worst bank runs we've ever had. 9,000 banks failed. $7 billion in deposits were frozen. People just couldn't get there. The, many, many of the banks weren't started up again, so they just lost their money totally. Uh, the money supply shrank. And uh, so what Roosevelt did was to use the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which had been started by Hoover, a Republican, uh, in order to fund the banks. That was the idea, but uh, Roosevelt's government used it to fund every sort of uh, development, every sort of industry, from small farms all the way up to big things like dams and roads and bridges and electricity, et cetera. Over, it started with a modest capitalization of 500 million. It uh, issued bonds, and over the next 25 years, it lent or invested over 40 billion dollars, funded the whole 
uh, New Deal, rebuilt the country, an amazing infrastructure that was built in the 1930s that's still around and funded our participation in World War II. And after all that, turned a profit to the government. So, and as Nomi, I think, <laughs> pointed out, uh, we, or maybe Alfeca pointed out that uh, we didn't actually pay off the debt. What happened was that productivity came up to meet it. And that is the way to beat inflation. If you have uh, su uh, supply shortages, which is what's calling our, causing our inflation right now, the solution is to increase the supply, not just uh, cut the amount of money that's in the, in the economy. So the stellar example right now is China which um, over four decades uh, grew from one of the poorest countries in the world to a global economic powerhouse, including building 12,000 miles of high-speed rail in a decade. Of course, it's built more than that now. And how did they do it? The government owns 80% of Chinese bank banking assets, including they have three massive uh, policy banks, which are basically development banks. So what they do is issue credit, like all banks do, and then... Um, the fees from whatever they build repay the repay the loans, and that has obviously worked out very well for them. The biggest of those banks is the China Development Bank, the largest development bank in the world. It has assets of two point thirty six trillion dollars, um, or the equivalent in yuan, of course, uh, seven hundred billion in loans as of twenty ten, quite a while ago. But I just saw an article on that, which was twice the World Bank's loans, and and then it, they have many branches, they don't take deposits, so it's not that type of branch, but the branches are for coordinating policies and projects, which is what our National Infrastructure Bank would also do. Um, what they do for their liquidity is they issue bonds, and they have such a huge bond market that it's 25% of the bond market of the entire country, and the, and the rest of it is the Ministry of Finance, which is basically the Treasury. And they have a uh, credit rating as high as the government's. And typically, they get three times as many bidders as they have bonds. I mean, these every, people want these bonds. They're highly sought after. They're, they're very careful about risks. They make sure that the projects they fund are going to pay back, et cetera. So in the course of 23 years, China's money supply grew. If Lincoln doubled the money supply, so China grew by 1,800%, by a factor of 18. And still, it wasn't inflationary. The bottom line is inflation, which has stayed level. And the reason, again, is that um, GDP, I mean, the money went into productivity. It didn't go into speculation. So supply and demand rose together. Um, China does have troubles now, but it's not because of its publicly owned banks. It's uh, largely because of its uh, property crisis and uh, the strict COVID containment measures where uh, small businesses were shut down, just like in the U.S. Um, and the property developers are largely privately funded. They issue bonds. I won't go too much into that, but the point anyway, it wasn't the development banks. So in 2022, the Chinese government pledged um, 118 billion worth of yuan to um, to the policy banks for infrastructure funding in order to revive the economy. And of course, it was their infrastructure that revived the whole global economy after the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. So we could do the same thing. We could revive our economy with the um, National Infrastructure Bank, HR 4052. Some great presentation and really appreciate you bringing up the information about uh, China. And I totally agree with your last point there that if China can do it, we can do it too. And we should be doing it. For our next speaker, uh, we are going to go to New York. We have with us this evening, Assemblywoman Mary Jane Shimsky. And, um, we have some exciting things happening in New York, and perhaps Mary Jane can bring us up to speed on that. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And we certainly have a lot going on with infrastructure here. Um, we've been getting funding for new manufacturers for, um, for chips and so on, which is really great. We've also gotten a lot of infrastructure funding for our basic infrastructure roads and bridges from the federal government. But 
one thing I will say, and this is something that that when you talk about these big numbers, people have a hard time believing, but it's certainly true. You are never going to get, even in a political system that's working perfectly well, you are never going to get the amount of appropriations you need to fix our infrastructure. We are so far behind with repairs. When you do add up the aggregate demand of all of the different kinds of infrastructures we have, all of the transportation, housing, schools, water, wastewater, um, electrical grid, energy of all types, um, internet service. The figure of unmet need over the next decade is probably somewhere around $7 trillion. I, susp I think we don't even really know because when it comes to sewers and the incredibly high number of miles of sewers we have in this country and given the shape they're in and how they are going to be less and less effective due to climate change and the amount of severe, quick flash severe storms we're having, um, it can easily be over that amount. So we need another way to do the funding even in the best of political times, um, I don't have to tell anyone who is well informed enough to be on this Zoom that we are not living in those times by any stretch of the imagination. So we need a way to fund the amount of money that we need to satisfy the demand for repaired and upgraded infrastructure. And we also need to find a way to make sure that the funding is immune from the political passions and divisiveness of a particular moment. A national infrastructure bank will do both of those things. It will make our ability to have roads, transportation, wastewater treatment, internet, and so on, not dependent on the current battles in Washington or in state houses. There will be another source of the funding that our governments and our NGOs can use to make sure that we have the kind of infrastructure that our people can live good lives on and that our economy can grow on. So all of you out there who, um, who may be new to the call, um, thank you and welcome and let's all work together um, we've had gotten a lot of support for the National Infrastructure Bank here in New York. We are getting more of our members of Congress signing on, but we need folks in every state to understand the need for this and move forward and welcome all of you to the fight. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. We really appreciate you being here and sharing those words of wisdom with us. Okay, um, now I had promised some information on training and we have with us this evening, uh, Mark Strand. He's the secretary treasurer of the New Mexico AFL-CIO and is very well versed in training programs. Uh, one of the questions we get often is, we have a labor shortage in our country right now. So if, if businesses can't get workers right now, how are we gonna get them for all of these new projects that are gonna be coming up? So Mark, can you help us understand that? Thank you very much. My name is Mark Strand. I'm the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO for the state of New Mexico. I'm also the president of the Central New Mexico Labor Council, assistant business manager for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I'm also a lineman. I've worked out on the power grid for the last 30 years. I wanna thank Noemi for her concern in going out and fighting for us for the power grid. For years, we have built lines around power stations. We've changed that now. Our grid is maintained by basically one generating station and getting the power out from that area. Now we're switching over to renewables where we're going to have to shift that power to where the part of the nation where we need it. It's going to have to go back and forth. We don't have one generation spot. We're going to have 
lows and highs across our grid. And we need to make sure that we can transport that power equally and safely across the grid. Right now, our apprenticeship, it takes four years for us to get a journeyman lineman. We need this money to build lines to help us train our apprenticeships. We can't just have an apprentice go out there and learn today and be able to do it tomorrow. It's a four-year program for us to train because when we make a mistake, we don't go home. IBEW was founded by Henry Miller because he saw two people go out every day and one person return. It was a death rate of 50%. We cannot go back in that direction. We need to make sure that our apprentices are well-trained on good jobs on the grid to make sure that they know what they're doing. It is a four-year program. It's a lot of work, and we need this infrastructure to make sure that our grid can handle the load, to make sure that we can get it across. For years, power companies would max out the grid to make sure that they had to profit. Well, now with renewables, we can't do that. We need to make sure that we have extra room on that grid to, to transport this power. That means that we're going to have to have these guys well-trained and up to speed. These apprenticeships are extremely, extremely important. I mean, you just can't go out, do it, and go back home. You have to make sure you know what you can't get away with on those lines. Because one mistake, and you don't go home. You don't go back to your family. It's, it's a hard trade, but it's been very rewarding throughout my career. I've really enjoyed it. I've helped out with hurricanes. I've helped out on ice storms. And you don't realize what it's like to not have the grid till you experience one of those. When you're out there for months on end without power, people realize how important the grid really is. And we need this training program to make sure that we have qualified workers out there every single day, every single day. And these big jobs are what supply our workers. They really do. When we don't know if we have enough work, we don't put apprentices out there because we can't have them start training and just stop for a while. The big jobs are really what found our apprenticeships and really help us through the end of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate that. I do want to point out that the National Infrastructure Bank has proposed is a long-term solution to a problem that's been in the making for the last 30 or 40 years. And the benefit of making this a long-term solution is that young people will be able to view apprenticeship programs as a long-term career. It's not just going to be a, a one-year or two-year boost with a big construction project. These projects are going to be ongoing, um, ongoing as we're able to continuously address uh, projects in different parts of the country. Um, okay, um, we have with us Lou De Palma from Rhode Island. Senator De Palma, I'd like to uh, turn it over to you for uh, a few comments. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I just joined. I'm just leaving the uh, Rhode Island State House now. You may be, I may seem like a ghost because I'm in the car, uh, but I'm watching the road, not watching uh, who's on the screen. But uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to join. Uh, so I'm a state senator in Rhode Island. I've been a state senator for uh, 15 years. I'm also a chief engineer for a uh, defense contractor where I've worked for the last 41 years. And I got a few years left to go, I think. Uh, but in Rhode Island, I've been associated with the National Infrastructure Bank and the coalition probably for, I can't remember how long now, four years, five years, I don't know, maybe longer. We passed a resolution years ago in the Rhode Island Senate. Uh, we had the folks from uh, labor, the Labor International Union North America, build Rhode Island, the Rhode Island Builders Association, sponsored a resolution for us. Uh, we got it to the Council on State Government's Eastern Region Conference, of which I'm the Vice Chair of the Transportation Committee for Eastern Region. Uh, we got them to pass a resolution on it. Uh, we brought it to the national. It didn't make it as a resolution because of, uh, not because of its merits, because of the process that was followed. Uh, with regards to getting congressional support for this, our previous congressman, Congressman David Cicilline, who uh, resigned in early part of this year to take on a Rhode Allen Foundation as the CEO. Uh, he had signed on. Chose not to run last year. So Congressman Seth Magaziner 
he's now a signatory, a co-sponsor of the bill. And I'm looking to get a new congressperson who just was uh, sworn in Monday night, uh, Congressman Gabe Amo, getting him to be a, uh, a sponsor of the bill as well. I've had discussions with Senator Whitehouse, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who you may have seen on the news because of his efforts with the uh, trying to get some ethics into the Supreme Court, which I guess they just passed the, the uh, not in Congress, but the Supreme Court did some uh, rules for how they do, how they should behave, et cetera. But I'm working to try and have, uh, I've talked with Senator Whitehouse's office about trying to get Senator Whitehouse as a uh, co-sponsor uh, on the Senate bill. Uh, with regards to the, it's somewhat apropos, they may have mentioned this earlier and I'll stop after this if there are any questions. Two years ago yesterday, in fact, I was fortunate and I have the pictures to prove it and they're not deep fakes from an artificial intelligence perspective, which is what my background is. I was at the signing of the II Washington. I also have the, the candy dish to prove it as well. Uh, I didn't buy it. I was it was given to me on the way out, but yep, yesterday it was two years and we know what the pace of Congress uh, and I respect all my, my two senators, one senator is head of the Armed Services Committee, Now and negotiating a national infrastructure bank, not that it would take three years, but uh, we will be ready for when the IIJA money runs out and we need to be ready now. There's way more needs as you folks know, and I'm telling you anything you already know, way more needs for which there was money and the work needs to get done. It's not gonna get done without this. Uh, and this is the right thing to do. So uh, if there are questions, I'll try and answer those, but working in the background as well with some of the labor unions, to help facilitate getting this uh, through Congress. However, I can add a piece, and I think all the work, all you folks that are on these calls that are doing, all play a significant part in making it happen. It's one of those where many hands make light work. Well, many hands are gonna make work. It's not light work, uh, but we'll get it done. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, Senator De Palma. We appreciate it. Okay, now we are going to go to Q&A in a minute. So if you have any questions or comments, please uh, raise your hand um, and you can either wave your hand or you can click on the button to raise your hand electronically uh, in the Zoom call. Um, but first, I have uh, a couple of slides. So one of the most effective things that we have found in building support is for you to actually call your congressperson and ask for a meeting. Um, so there is the number, you see it on your screen, 202-224-3121. Um, you can call any member of Congress at that number, ask them to sponsor HR 4052, and we would be happy to set up a Zoom call with your congressperson and you and your friends. And, um, and we have found this very, very effective in terms of uh, building support for our legislation. So um, then once you have called your congressperson or if you want some help on that, you can email our office. And if we go back to the previous slide, our email address was there. You see it, info at nibcoalition.com. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, we do have uh, a helpful little flyer that's on our website. And so this is something that you would be able to download and print and bring it with you if you are, uh, if you might, happen to run into one of your representatives or your senators, they're all gonna be home from Washington DC for the Thanksgiving holiday. And perhaps you'll be hobnobbing with them or you know, see them at the grocery store. And, um, or you might just drop by their offices and drop off a flyer and ask for their support. So again, this flyer is located on our website and that is nibcoalition.com. So, um, so th there we go, some uh, little uh, helps for all of our supporters. And with that, I wanna go to um, the folks on our call and to answer any questions or see if we have any comments. And uh, we are gonna start with uh, Nelson Betancourt who has his hand up. Nelson, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Um, to, to Alan Brown uh, or Nomi Prince, uh, can they explain how do you turn debt in exchange for shares in a bank? How do you turn debt into equity? What's the process? What is, and why does that happen? Why is that allowed to happen? 
Ellen, well, anyway, you want to pick up, perhaps? Okay, so at that time, in um, at the end of the, um, the the Revolutionary War, of course, the debt was in the form of paper continentals, which were they should have been issued directly just as money, but in fact, they a lot of them were issued as de you know debts or for future promises to pay, and so you could just turn in your continentals, which were virtually you know worth very little at that time and it was big scandal that it, they had been devalued so much but you could turn them in and purchase a certain amount of uh shares in the bank and along with some gold you were supposed to also contribute gold and i saw that actually the um the chinese bank the uh, chinese development bank used uh, debt for equity swaps in order to get well that's a long story but maybe nomi has something more <laughs> more enlightening to add no i mean I, I, that's that's really the process because debt as, as ellen said it, it's it's basically a it's it's it it, it achieves uh, it, we pay interest basically as 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 the government on this sort of promise to repay all of the principal later so there's money that's constantly sort of being paid for to holders of that debt effectively to maintain that promise through the life of that particular debt so 10-year treasury maintain that promise for 10 years pay interest on that for 10 years so what what the what the swap looks like um and as ellen mentioned whether it's through the chinese development bank Lincoln did it back in the day with debt to equity back then. What the swap does is say, all right, well, if you are holding debt, i.e. I, as a government, I as a bank, am owing you interest. Well, you basically pledge or give me your debt and continue to pay interest, but I also instead swap that into shares. So now you're owner of the bank. You're, you're effectively an equity stakeholder in sort of the new thing. Um, and the money that is coming in as interest on that debt is now partially going back out to you um, as in, in return, basically as return on the equity that now you have by owning a portion of, of that bank. So the idea is that you're, you're, you're swapping something that is paying some kind of an interest into a different security, which is now paying effectively a dividend or some form of a share or, or an upside to that particular debt, the old security, the bond. So you're just basically saying, all right, I'll give you this. Okay. And in return, I'm getting a larger stake in, in the new institution, um, some of which also issue bonds. I mean, there are, um, and, uh, I know if I could, can speak to this as well, there, there is the ability to also issue bonds and swap certain debt for other debt where you're effectively, whether it's longer term or whether a different kind of debt, and you're still receiving that interest because you basically repledged or purposed, repurposed the debt that you were holding um, mm -hmm. in return for a share. It's what the Federal Reserve does basically with our banks. Um, our banks are shareholders um, of the Federal Reserve. They, they, they hold treasury. They basically pledge treasuries to the, uh, to the Federal Reserve, and they are also shareholders of the Federal Reserve. So it's not a, quite a swap, but it's... it's um, Two different forms of of receiving money off of basically the same debt from the Fed to the larger banks and the banking system. And and if I could add, Nelson, the question you're asking, we get asked many times. Oh, yeah. uh, because it does, it's not intuitive. And mm -hmm. so to make it really simple, it is easier. What Nomi says is about the interest on the treasuries is is absolutely correct. But if you look at it even just as an IOU, a treasury is an IOU where a, a person has bought this IOU from the federal government, given the federal government the cash to cover their deficit, which is their debt, and then gotten this IOU. So the, if you look at it from this perspective, it depends on who you're talking to, um, who, who is the owner. A treasury is a debt obligation of the federal government, but for the person who bought the IOU, it's an asset. And you can even sell those treasuries to each other. And then the debt, you know, the obligation to get repaid transfers to another person. Mm -hmm. The simple transaction that's going on here with the capitalization of the bank is an holder of this asset, the treasury, swaps it to the NIB in exchange for preferred stock, which is another asset. So it's mm -hmm. just an asset to asset swap just changing hands the same as selling a treasury in the secondary market. Thank yeah. you very much to all of you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay.
Um, Don Siefkes is on uh, the call and has his hand up. Don, do you have a question or a comment? Well, I have one question and one comment. The question I have is also for Ellen. Ellen, the purpose of the first bank in the United States was to invest in infrastructure, unlike the Bank of England. What was the purpose of the Bank of England then? <laughs> well, it, it was set up because the king uh, was fighting a war with France. Was it with France, I think? And um, needed funding. And so these financiers got together and agreed to lend the government money, but um, in the form of gold, of course, at that time when we were on a gold standard. And they, the, the deal was that they didn't have to pay pay the money back, but they had to keep paying interest, like in perpetuity, that they were basically renting the money supply. So the money supply was issued, well, it was paper money backed by gold. So sorry, I said that wrong. So it was paper money, um, um, Bank of England banknotes that would that were being rented to the government, whereas for interest. So that was the purpose of the bank, obviously, was just to make money off the government. Whereas the um, the first U.S. bank, the purpose of the bank was development, and that's I mean that's the way Hamilton yeah, wrote right, it. Very interesting. Thank you. Now, Julie, my comment is the normal comment that I make. I forgot to email you today. I still want to get Alfaka Mutardi on national television. And we've got 35 people on the call now. If everybody could email tomorrow, the email only works on Friday, varneyviewers at foxbusiness.com and ask him to interview Alfaka Mutardi on his show. He is the most friendly Fox business person there is. He carries some weight. And uh, I think we just need to get some national television going on this. And if he gets 35 emails tomorrow, I've been emailing the guy for the last 10 weeks. I don't every Friday. I don't know if anybody reads him or not, but it can't hurt. It only takes you a few minutes. I think it would really help. If you could put that in the chat, uh, Julie, I'd appreciate it. Varney, V A V is and Victor A R N E Y viewers at foxbusiness.com. Okay. My... Thank, thanks, Don. I know actually we had quite a few people um, that did email in after our last call. I had um, people emailing me, what, what was that email address again? And, and that sort of thing. So I know we were on it, but uh, let's just keep up that effort. We also get this comment quite a few times on our on our calls, people asking like, why don't you have any national publicity or why hasn't Alfeca been on, you know, CNN or, or that kind of thing? And, you know, it's not really so easy. And it kind of brings me to another point, which we are a grassroots volunteer organization. We don't have any lobbyists other than all of us volunteers. And um, so everything we do is, is volunteer. And um, so we appreciate everyone's help in terms of um, moving this along. Did you repeat the, the email one more time? I don't. Oh, there it is. I see it. OK, never mind. Yeah, don't forget the E, V-A-R-N-E-Y, viewers. And um, so hopefully, you know, one of these days we'll get that invitation for Alfetta to appear on Fox News. That would be wonderful. OK, um, now if you have a, a question or a comment, raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and call on some people. And uh, so we have some folks on the line that have been very involved in, um, in our efforts around the country. And we have Ruth Fruland here from Seattle, the Pacific Northwest. She's been very involved with the efforts in Washington State, where a resolution in support has passed both houses of uh, the, uh, Washington, um, uh, Washington, the House and the Senate. Uh, we've had a resolution get through the Seattle City Council. We have, do we have one co-sponsor from Washington, Ruth, now, or wh where are we at with that? Oh, we have, we have more co-sponsors, but um, for the resolution, but I wanted to mention uh, that Stu sent to me today an article out of the Seattle Times that's talking about uh, cost overruns for finishing a bridge across Lake Washington from the Kirkland Bellevue side to the Seattle side. And it seems like it's a perfect opportunity to um, use it as an example to compare what the NIB could do versus the traditional forms of, you know, taking it out of the budget or, you know, buying bonds, whatever the, 
the way they would deal with the shortfall, which is like, uh, you know, high. It's like, it's already very expensive, but it's like 500 million. Or, uh, I get my, my billions and my trillions confused, but it's a lot of money. And uh, so it's kind of a shock because the engineers that were saying how much it would cost to finish this bridge, um, and it's like, well, they didn't expect it to be 800 billion or whatever it is, uh, 800 million or 800 billion, whichever it is. And um, so I think that if we could come up, another idea is to come up with some specific examples. This is what you would say if you had an NIB. This is what you would say if you had an NIB and a state bank. It's not only saving, it would be directly there you get the money fast because one of the problems with what Biden has done is that the money isn't getting through. It's It doesn't have the um, panels to do it. They're just not worked out. That's my understanding. So someone else can speak to that. But um, not only is it not sufficient uh, what Biden has proposed, but it isn't working because it doesn't have the, um, in, the, the delivery infrastructure for the money to go from the national to the state to the projects. As, as is often the case with many federal projects, the paperwork requirements are quite substantial as I understand it. And so it's very challenging for many smaller communities, school districts, water districts, and that sort of thing to have the expertise just to be able to put the paperwork to request a grant. So very challenging. And uh, again, that would be another benefit of the NIB is that we would have uh, expertise on board that would be able to help communities uh, do their financial application and justification. But thank you, Ruth. And I don't know if you knew um, that our folks, um, our or organizers and Nomi Prince when they were on the Capitol uh, had a meeting with uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's the uh, conservative or her staff, the conservative um, representative from over on the east side in Spokane area. And so they were able to meet with her and um, and we are out there on a regular basis talking to um, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, anyone who will listen to us. Okay, Actually, uh, I, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand on this thing, but can I add one thing to that? Yeah. Because um, that was in my mind as you were saying that. It, it, it was a really good meeting with um, Kathy McMorris's senior staffer, and, and she, of course, is the chair of the Energy and, and Commerce Committee. Actually, when we were there that morning, there was no, at the time, House Speaker selected. It was one of the, that whole sort of free-for-all moment. And uh, we had talked about her running. And of course, she's doing a real job, so, <laughs> so I running the ENC. Um, but the point being, I've, I've looked at her legislation as well since we had that meeting. And again, very bipartisan, very promotional of economic equality through energy um, and energy infrastructure building. And it just seems like if we're doing a lot of work in Washington, that it might be worth um, sort of mentioning what, what's what's just happening now back to them and sort of a follow up because also her senior staffer who we met with seemed very receptive um, and sort of anti Fed and sort of major debt um, in terms of the repurposing element of debt into into the energy sector and of course that that's her work um, so it seemed a very reasonable place obviously there's politics involved but to to really kind of bring all of our might um, um, into her and into her office. Okay, th thank you for that input, uh, Nomi. So, Ruth, stay tuned. It could be that we're going to be doing some more organizing there in Washington State. Um, next, I'd like to call on Craig Schwartz. He's the chair of the Rural Caucus for the Ohio Democrats, and he recently ran for Congress. I know he spent months um, going around from one rural community to another in Ohio. And Craig, can you sort of bring us up to speed on the infrastructure needs in Ohio and, and how we're doing with support for the NIB there? Well, the infrastructure needs to remain the same. Uh, they are uh, great. I like what Mark was talking about before about the grid. Uh, this is something that uh, remains uh, a significant problem throughout the Midwest. We have areas for instance like kansas illinois and iowa that are are far uh, leading other states in terms of wind power uh, other renewables and yet they can't transmit that power 
uh, over to other states on a shared basis. If we were able to modernize the grid, we could um, efficiently modernize or progress our energy efficiency much more than just keep building uh, and adding on. Modernizing the grid will greatly uh, just make the whole thing much more efficient. And, and that's what we should be focusing on more than just building more nuclear power plants and uh, finding other, uh, you know, drilling, drilling, drilling like they're doing right now in Ohio. Uh, here's something, a news flash. The uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources just opened up a whole bunch of state parks for fracking. That was just announced yesterday. Uh, this is not a really good thing. So our uh, legislature right now is focused on uh, oil and gas. They're funded by that you know, through their lobbyists. And unfortunately, um, they put further restrictions on trying to expand wind power and solar power in the state. I was uh, just jotting down some notes from the earlier speakers. I noted that um, both when Novi said something to the effect of the NRB would actually make money. And then uh, Assemblywoman Shimsky said later on, raise enough money to satisfy the demand or appetite for infrastructure improvement. These things you could sell to the Republicans because the state budgets are mandated uh, for, you know, they have to be balanced. So they, they, you know, these guys have to think outside the box. You have to find additional um, you know, structures. And Ellen is absolutely right. I mean, I'm gonna run for, um, I mean, this is something else most of you don't know, but I'm collecting petitions. I'll probably be hitting you up for money in the next few months, but I'm gonna be collecting petitions and, and running for the state house here in Ohio. And the state public bank, uh, which was one of my campaign planks when I ran for state senate several years ago, is going to be at the forefront along with the NIB. Ohio needs this. When you drive up and down these roads every day, these same Republicans, these same township trustees, the commissioners, everybody else, see the same things I see, and it's dilapidation. And we're not moving forward. We're not, you know, putting the modernizing the grid by burying the lines. We're just keep hanging the lines. So make him still susceptible to climate change. So you know, these are the kinds of things, mass transit. I have a disabled son. I would love, to, I know a number of them here in my community that cannot get transportation on a weekend basis or for the, those people working second or third shifts can't get it after hours. So fixing rural transportation doesn't have to be, mad. when I talk about mass transportation in rural areas, it doesn't have to be trains. It could be simple, simply as something as expanding the bus service so that people can get to work safely. So that's that's where I'm at. Uh, that's the update. I push this. Uh, by the way, uh, the other thing that I do on a spare time is I work for Dems 101. Uh, that is a, a new organization that is modernized in the Democratic Party. Uh, it has been uh, spurred on by Jim Purvis, the author of the book. And we are getting more rural organizations signed on to that rural counties. Ohio, in fact, is leading the country in counties endorsing the new Democratic creed. And there is going to be a synergy between what the Dems 101 want to push. And I have asked, I just had this strategy session with their leadership. I want to, they're going to have a national meeting in April of next year in the Detroit area. And I think the NIB should be making a presentation. To this group, we are now spreading in eight states across the country. So this is a I democratic function, but it is trying to reach across. Julie, the Julie, can, why don't we see what Senator De Palma and Mary Jane Shimsky have to say about the situation? Sure. So, um, Senator De Palma, I see you're still there in your car. I am. The uh, I, I listened to most of it. I, I lost some of it based on some of the areas I went through, uh, specifically on the uh, the bank itself or the what's happening from the legislative congressional perspective, or what would you like? Um, sure. And also, Rhode Island is such a small state. Um, it is. So, what are the so in, from a Rhode Island perspective, an infrastructure bank is something that's not foreign to us. We have a Rhode Island infrastructure bank. And we created it probably 10 or so years ago. And it's uh, obviously, nobody likes the word steroids. Steroids are good at times, not a lot. Uh, the National Infrastructure Bank is analogous to the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank 
except on steroids to the exponential power of 10 or 12 kind of thing. Uh, but it's been very effective because it allows the cities and towns, uh, water districts, if we have, we don't have many of those in Rhode Island, uh, to be able to borrow money at a very low interest rate where, the, we're, because we're leveraging the uh, bond rating of the state and not the municipality that might be lower for whatever reason, because the infrastructure work needs to happen. So whether it's uh, drinking water, whether it's wastewater, whether it's roads, you name it, we're leveraging our Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank uh, to do that. It's been effective. And so it's, the same thing will happen at the national level that people will be able to borrow to make up the difference of money that they can could need to get from somewhere else to get the work done because the work's not going away. So it's a, uh, we've seen and it's been demonstrated in Rhode Island, like I said, we're small, we're not the smallest state by population, it's only a small state by size, uh, that an infrastructure bank has been extremely beneficial. By the one thing I was gonna mention earlier, our previous governor, uh, some people will recognize the name because she's made it to the national level, convinced she'll be a vice president or president. Of the United States at some point is Secretary Gina Raimondo, who is the Secretary of Commerce. So we've had uh, discussions with her office back going on two plus years ago. I see her every once in a while. I text her every once in a while. She's from Rhode Island, her family's still in Rhode Island. Uh, so the, if somebody said the infrastructure bank to Secretary Raimondo, would she say, I never heard of that? No, would she know the details of it? Probably not remember them, uh, but we have had conversations with her in the past on this, uh, as well as I'm sure Stu's probably mentioned with Secretary of Transportation Buttigieg's office and his folks a while back. So. Cool, that sounds great. We'll have, we'll have to send her one of those flyers, those downloadable flyers that we have on our website. Mm -hmm. So Correct. thank you, S Senator De Palma. You're welcome. Okay, we have um, Mary Jane Shimsky, uh, I believe is still on the call from New York. And I believe that New York has the distinction of having, is it the largest infrastructure project in terms of dollars with, is it the Gateway Tunnel or what are they calling that project, Mary Jane? Yeah, I think Mary Jane got off, Julie. Oh, she did, okay. Okay, well, uh, we'll have to uh, bring that question back for next time, but. Uh, Tim, ha Timothy has his hand up. Timothy, do you have a question or a comment? Well, maybe not. You're muted. Okay. Um, well, seeing no other questions, um, I think that brings us to the end of our presentation tonight. And uh, we do have a, a couple of additional slides. And um, if we can show our NIB action page, this is, um, this is a page on our website where you will be able to find what all the latest developments are, the things that we're working on. And um, uh, so I would like uh, everyone to take a look. Here's our, our website, the NIB co nibcoalition.com. Uh, there's a wealth of information on there. Our videos are recorded and available for viewing. And we've had plenty of experts on our calls over the years. I think they're very interesting, really some fascinating experts that uh, have been with us. Um, now, everyone um, asks us, where do you get the money from to, uh, to pay for these Zoom calls, to uh, pay for the editing of the videos, the website and all that sort of thing. And again, it's purely a volunteer a volunteer effort, and um, and we rely on donations from from our supporters and from folks like you. Our um, our monthly needs, our budget is three thousand dollars a month. Um, that pays for our our expenses, and um, and we still need about two thousand dollars still um, by the end of this month to make sure that all of our expenses are paid. So. Um, we would really appreciate your help. If you can go to our website, we do have a donate button. Uh, any donation from uh, $5 to $500 is greatly appreciated and will allow us to continue to fund our operations. We, uh, we also spend, spend money on advertising. We've done digital and social media advertising as well as uh, advertisements, print advertisements in newspapers and in um, uh, pages that cater to our uh, elected officials, state elected officials and such. 
We pay for, um, uh, have paid for lobbying to send our representatives to uh, Capitol Hill and also to co conferences around the country. And so your donations are greatly appreciated and put to good use. Now, the other thing that we could use is uh, some help. We've actually had a couple interns uh, recently that were able to help us with some video editing, social media types of things. And so if this sounds like something that you would be interested in helping out with, we would appreciate it. We could use your help. So uh, if you're interested, um, would like to help us with our media, our Zoom calls, uh, just send an email to our, um, to our email address, info at nibcoalition.com. So that brings us to the end of our webinar this evening. And um, there you have our website, our Facebook page, our Twitter, our email. Um, thanks for being here, everyone. Have a great Thanksgiving week, and, um, and we'll see you next month. Bye, everyone.